Yeah, at the end of the day, it's all about, you know, selling the fight and getting out here and beating the bushes to make this thing happen. And, uh, you know, we've got to do what you got to do, right? And uh, I know we're both focused on March 4th, and, of course, this is, uh, this is part of it. I think it's, um, I think for me it's putting the fight away. I think it's a, a chapter I need to close. I think for him it's another opportunity. I think, you know, he had the opportunity the first time we fought. It gives him another opportunity to try to, you know, come out with the W. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't really even see it as selling the fight because this is a meaningful fight. People want to see the fight. And I think we just explained it, why you want to see the fight. Why should it happen? Why, you know, um, is this a chapter that needs to be closed? What can be done differently? It was, it was so much that went on if he was there watching it. And even in the fight in the moment, it's hard to remember everything that happened. So I think it's our job to remind people why this is such an important fight in the best division that's in the, you know, in the world. It's, I, I'm certain that both of you guys have some regrets about the outcome of the majority draw, but in a way, coming back with a rematch and having a lot more buzz about your fight than even you had in New York, is that a good thing for both of you? Do you embrace that part of it? Oh uh, Yeah, I embrace it. I, I think that people saw a lot in both of us and saw that he can, you know, take take punches and become durable and come back and even win the, um, the final round after being nearly finished. And they can also say that, you know, in the past people have been curious on whether or not I was able to go to whole five. Um, it was a great fight. I said it from the beginning. I said this will be the best fight on the card and the best card of the history of the sport. It lived up to that and we ended up getting fighting tonight. Yes. I think that alone is going to make people want to watch it. You know? I agree, man, 100%. You know, it, the last fight, I mean, you know, it's it is what it, it is what it is, and we're gonna do it again. So, you know. What are the things that each of you that you guys are kicking yourselves over that first outcome? What is the thing that bothers you most about your? your just just not uh, for for me, it wasn't pulling the trigger enough. You know, a little hesitant during the fight, but you know, we all you know, I got some things got to go back and work on, and uh, you know, after the fight, we went back and watched uh, with my coaches, and they were kicking me, kicking my ass, trying to, you know, figure out what was going on in my head when I was out there. So just get out there and pulling the trigger. No, I think for me, you know, there's several things I can do a lot differently in the fight. I think I'm a, you know, a well-rounded fighter. You know, I can do a lot of different things. I can strike, I can wrestle, I can grapple. Um, I think, you know, we saw me stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the best strikers in our division and probably one of the more creative strikers in the UFC. And I kind of got that out there so now people can see that. Um, this fight, I think it's just important to, to know your worth and know what you can do and know what you can do. And um, obviously for myself, pulling the trigger a little bit more as well. You know, the moments when I stepped forward and I did, um, I did the damage, you know, I was moving forward and pulling the trigger. And obviously I'm not gonna get my game plan out, but you know, I do have so many different layers of me as a fighter and I can utilize wrestling. I can utilize jiu so I can utilize striking. I can utilize counter. And um, I do feel like even with not doing 100% of what my game plan was in the last fight, I feel like I did enough to win the fight. So now going into the second time around, if I thought I won that time, and now I'm planning on coming back and doing more, I, I want to make this really convincing. And just to refresh everyone's memory, can you tell which, which rounds do you believe you won? And uh, you can tell us the same thing. <clears throat> uh, I believe I won the first round and the fourth round, clearly. Um, I really, when I watched the fight, I haven't watched the whole fight through. Um, because all I needed to know if I, is if I won the third round. So I watched the third round probably five or six times. Each time I watched the round, I felt like I won. So even with no 10 eights or anything, I felt like I won rounds one, round three, and round four. For me, it was round two, round three, and round five that I thought I won. So, um, you know, those are the rounds that I thought I, I, I had pulled out. And, and um, you know, but, you know, it, it, was, it is what it is. It was a draw, and we're going to be doing round two. I think everyone agrees it was a very close fight. I'm wondering, you know, with the rematch, how much of an advantage do you have now that you've seen, you know, there's probably always a little mystery when you're fighting someone for the first time. Is there an advantage of fighting the second time? You know, now that there's less mystery? I mean, you kind of get a feel out there for them. You know, you got the, you've already been out there with them once. I'm not, not saying that you know all their tricks, but, you know, you, get, you do have a feel, uh, you know, where they're strong, where they're not strong. And uh, so going into it, it will make it that much more exciting knowing that, yes. I, I just personally think that, you know, I found out where I was a little bit more stronger in areas that I didn't think I would be in. So I think, you know, when you're going back and you're running it back and you're remixing it, I think that it's positions I can be extremely dominant in. 
um, you know, on the feet, on the ground, against the cage, you know, even even backing up, coming forward, you know, using different things that I think that going back is things that I can make up and I can change within the training camp. I think certain things Stevie can't change in the training camp. You can't change 20 years of wrestling and, and Division One, you know, credentials. You can't change, you know, jiu-jitsu credentials. You can't change that in six weeks. Now, granted, my game plan is not to go out and try to, you know, I'll blitz him and, you know, do spinning wheel kicks and, and outpoint him in that aspect. But I think that my ability to stop him and stifle and neutralize his game, I have a way better chance of doing that in six weeks than he does. There's been some change in the the judging criteria in 2017 is basically designed to maybe have more 10 eights. And obviously that was a point of contention in your fight. There was a 10 eight in the first round, there was a 10 eight in the fourth round. How do you think that new judging criteria may work to your advantage on March 4th? Uh, I don't think it was clear on what they were what they were judging. I think one judge, um, and I'm okay with the first judge, that said I won rounds one, rounds three, and round four. I got no 10 eights, but I still would have won the fight. Um, one judge gave me the first round, and, and you guys saw the fight. I think I was a lot closer to finishing the fight in the fourth than I was in the first. The other judge flip-flopped it. He gave me the one in the fourth round. So um, I think that our sport in general, we need to get better you know, aligned on what we're seeing and what we're judging. I think the, the judges and I think the fighters, they need to have a conference say, this is what we're looking at. This is what we're scoring. I guarantee you if we knew a clear-cut you know, example of what we're being scored and what's, you know, what, the way we should fight, I guarantee you people will train differently and fight differently. So I don't think, I don't like the new rules. I don't like the new judging. You don't have the first set of rules in, in, in the first set of judging down pack. So how are you going to keep implementing, keep changing? I think it's going to cause a lot of confusion and shit. Yeah, I, you know, I don't even think about it, to be honest with you. Just go out there and, and um, obviously I didn't put enough into it to try and get that W at the last time, but um, you know, especially when you're when you're, when you're when you're out there fighting the champ, you got to go out there and just give it all you got, and you know, not leave it up for the judges. And in the first fight, leading up to it and during it, there was even some sort of uh, comparison of your actual genetics. Question whether time could go to five rounds or his muscle mass. There was talk about the guillotine was so deep that maybe your neck was thin enough to uh, you know. The little peanut head popped out the damn choke. Uh, he's got tremendous strength, man. He's got a lot of strength. Uh, you feel that, uh, you know, in that first round, being being on the bottom, he's a very strong opponent, especially in the clinch positions. So his strength, man, he's 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 a strong dude. I would say timing probably. You know, it's, it's a couple times I knew a counter was coming, and I was actually trying to bait bait him with counter, and then even knowing it and seeing it, I still got hit with it. So uh, I would probably say timing because I think I'm faster, but. Being faster and when you have someone that has good timing, they're quick, sometimes they can get to you before you can get to that person. So I'll probably have to say timing. That's a weird question I've never asked. Ah, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned you, were, you don't like the new rules? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't ever think, think back in a fight where I was like, oh, man, if I could have grabbed his fucking clavicle, then I would have won this fight. Like, I don't understand. Like, like how about we make the rules that we have right now clear before we try to say, okay, now if somebody has a fingertip down and one knee, you can soccer kick them in the face. But on the ground, I can lay here and I can lean over and elbow you. And that's the exact same thing as a 12 to six, but I'm just leaning forward. I think we have a hard time enough gauging that. And who's going to know that's the worst stuff ever. Like now if you poking somebody in the eye and it's a complete foul, some guys do that to get a break, like no, no crap. But if I'm if I'm used to boxing and parrying and catching, and somebody come forth and I'm like this, that technically can be an immediate point. And how do you judge that? Yeah. So. Yeah. And what about for the takedowns? Uh, you, you won't score unless damage is actually to take him down. Getting the mount isn't enough. You actually have to inflict damage. Is that uh, change? Once again, what's damage? Like, what are you scoring? Are you scoring on damage or are you scoring on point? If you if you were scoring on point, then our fight was a draw. If you're scoring on damage, then I clearly won. We, the judges, and especially in different commissions, they don't have it down on what they're scoring anyway. So I don't agree with that. I think if you take somebody down, if they really want to get deep with it, if Warner Boy was to take me down, I think they should score way higher than if I was to take him down because I'm the one that's supposed to be the wrestler. So that would mean that the judges would have to have knowledge on the people and what they do. If he was able to take me down and control me, 
then that should score almost like me knocking them down. For sure. Yeah. But it, they will have to know the fighters, and, you know, it, it's not their job to learn every fighter on the roster. Holding it. I know. I guarantee his mind changed now, though. What was it about his style of fight that you couldn't make the same He's explosive. He's a, he's a very explosive fighter. Not just with with you know a very strong wrestler, but uh, his timing also with with his right hand. He's very good at timing with that right hand. He hit me in between punches. Uh, his clinching uh, strength. I mean, he was just he's a, he was a powerful guy. You know what I mean? And that's what surprised him the most, especially in those clinch positions, was how strong he was. Was it, the, was it your timing of both of you, which made you both said you wish you, um, you went first, you went, you know, you didn't, you didn't hold back so much. Was it because of the timing you guys were so hesitant of each other? Maybe, maybe, maybe uh, knowing that, you know, we're both, he's got, he's got great counterattacks too. So maybe it was, it was because we were both waiting on somebody to throw a punch and we were going to counter them. I don't know. I mean, it's easy hindsight. I said I could have went forward, or I could have got faded back on the crack with a blitz or something like. So, I think it goes both ways. I do agree that sometimes when you have good counter abilities, sometimes you rely on it and you kind of wait. You use someone walking you down. Um, I knew with him, I had to be patient when I watched film. Every fighter that just said, "Forget it, I'm just going in," those are the ones that ended up on the ground. So, um, being patient against somebody that's that tricky is tough because you want to go. But also, you know, it's kind of like, hey, what the fuck are you about to do? What am I going to do? It's kind of like a, a teeter out of the deal. What did you feel? Did you learn anything about yourself as a fighter in that fourth round? Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Have you ever been, in, in your whole lifetime, actually, been that hurt? Um, there was a few times where, you know, previous fights where I was hurt. Obviously, my second one in the UFC when I fought Matt Brown. Um, uh, just not giving up, man. I've always been that way. No matter how hard, you know, how much you're hurt, you stay focused on what you got to stay focused on, and, and you and just don't give up, man. And, and that I think um, a lot of the fans out there saw that 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 night, and um, and uh, you know, I gained a lot of fans just from that. Tyron, thoughts on this trip? I mean, is this the fight you wanted next, or where? I know there were some other opponents. Actually. Um, you know, it's about five or six fights I think in my career that. Being victorious in those fights, you know, I, I would be the best welterweight um, that's ever fought in the um, octagon. Obviously, rematching him was one of the fights. Um, I think at some point, you know, Robbie Lawler might earn his way back up. I might have to fight him again. Damian Maya, someone that's poor little Damian Maya, just caught in the holster, and you know, he hasn't even been offered to me as an opponent ever. Um, you think about the Diaz brothers, you think about Connor, you think about George St. Pierre. You know, if I walk away with victories against those guys, you know. It's undeniable that I'm the best welterweight in the world ever, and that's that's really my goal. So I always knew that I would have to fight him again, but I didn't necessarily feel obligated that I had to fight him immediately next. Um, even if he held out and I took another fight or if he fought somebody else, I knew that I would fight him again. Even if it wasn't immediate, he's a high-level guy, got there for a reason, so he would probably beat another person to get there. I knew I would fight him again, but I didn't necessarily feel like I had to fight him then. Why did it not happen with Nick? Um, that's a good question, man. You guys need to talk to UFC about that. I think that's, um, I think it's a missed opportunity um, for UFC 209. It's a huge marketing push. Um, he's somebody that's a legend in the sport. I think he's the all-time top five welterweight. Someone that I saw a lot in strike force. He was always on my lens to compete against. And it was more of a respect thing that I feel like someone has done that much for the sport. Now that we get to a point where the platform is higher and the paycheck can be larger, he probably should, you know, been able to fight me. So what, um, given all the various options you laid out, what made you decide that going straight to the rematch was the right choice right now? Well, you know, I had I had committed to fighting Wonder Boy already, and um, then some other options came in. And I'm like, man, some stuff I didn't even think about. And I actually was low key pissed at Wonder Boy because I was trying to pump out my champ life video, which you guys need to check out on YouTube. I was planning on pumping that all weekend. Then on my podcast, I was going to announce that I was fighting Warner Boy, but he jumped the gun and posted out the bot agreement. So then we just kind of rolled with that. But needless to say, uh, we in here, we're doing it again. So, so even even though you were still saying you wanted to fight maybe O'Connor or someone else, 
you knew by that weekend I knew I was fighting one of one. And and what I was doing was, you know, drama. I had I had some no not drama I'm not creating drama, it was already there, but you know, right. if if I got some good footage and some good video of me and Bisping having an organic little spat in the back sure. after me and Wonder Boy fight, yeah. maybe someone would be thinking, hey, like, hey man, maybe they can fight, you know, against Bisping. So And you always get like the super fights, you know, they're typically a bigger payday. What, what do you think of super fights? If if you one day if you get the title, is, is that something that you would uh, also Oh yeah, consider, uh, definitely. Or do you believe the next person in line should get the Well, you know, I, I for me personally and, and I you know, it's you defend that title a few times, you know, earn it. It's always and, different and until you get this. Yeah, I, 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 bet, was, I, I bet I had it is, that man. same <laughs> talk until I got that. And you watch everybody that's not the champion making three or four times the amount of money as the champion. It's, it's, it's really distasteful for the sport. How are you going to say the world? Sorry to cut you off, too. No, but the world so. champion, the best fighter in the world, how do you have a super fight where people not even fighting in weight class make four or five times the amount of you? That's, that's embarrassing. You don't see LeBron James making quite a bit less than somebody that wears a flashy suit and talks crap and didn't even make it to the playoffs. So, you know, that's where we are. Sorry. For no, that's up. okay. For me, yeah, that was, that was it. Just earn, earn that fight. Speaking of money, um, has anything changed your contract status with UFC with, um, now that you defended the belt? Uh, no, I, I I got a new contract before I fought Wonder Boy, so it was something I was comfortable with. So whoever my next opponent was, um, I was cool fighting on that on that current contract. Obviously, if I fight somebody else, that they're going to be making like a lopsided amount of money. We have to sit down and figure something different. I'm fighting Connor, and I know he's about to walk in with a 3.5 million dollar purse. You know, we got to see what percentage of that I should be getting paid. So for this particular fight, I think my existing contract is, um, you know. What it should be. Satisfied. Yeah, for sure. We get a little bit off the fight. Um, you released a video a couple days ago, uh, him celebrating Martin Luther King. Yeah. Right. Um, have you done that every year, or that, did you feel it was important this year in particular? I, I feel that? like sub, um, subconsciously, I always address it, and I always think about you know the freedom fighters that fought for our freedom. I always think about you know people that sacrifice for us. At the time when Martin Luther King was doing that, he didn't know he was going to be Martin Luther King. He was doing it because it was right. And we all too often forget as fighters and celebrities or whatever you want to call us, we got an obligation to really point out stuff that's just completely wrong. You know, Muhammad Ali did it best. He said, I might lose some money in this. I might sit out for a year or two in my prime, but this is right. And that's why people remember him. And I just made, you know, I made a, a vow to myself that this year, if things are unjust and things that aren't true and things that are, you know, racially driven, I'm not going to be quiet and not speak on it. You know, I'm going to be honest. In the past, I was like, hey, I don't want to speak on certain issues because the second I say one thing about race, then I'm race baiting, then I'm all oh, tyrants pulling the race car. But if you really think about it, what is a race car? The race car is that the man held me down and I had unfair, you know, circumstances and now I wasn't able to be successful because someone held me down. What do you think this is? This is not me being a victim. This is not me making an excuse. This is me making a way out of no way. This is me rising above my situation. And that's what people need to see. That's what kids need to see. That yeah, you might live in a, a, a poverty environment, but that's, that doesn't have to be you. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be you. So I put that video out, and I'm not gonna wait till February 28th to do some things for Black History Month, because it is true. I do get, and if I show you the tweets and the stuff on my phone from like fans, you know, complete hatred, complete race. And granted, they're hiding behind a keyboard, but if we want to act as if race and sport doesn't exist, some people really want, oh, it's 2017. Nobody's racist. Nobody, nobody says that negative stuff to you. Nobody thinks that way. Nobody discriminates anymore. You know, we have a black president. That's, that's, not, that's not truth. That's not reality. You know what I mean? I have walked into Tom Ford and someone looking at me like, what you doing in here? You can't afford nothing in here. Well, technically I kind of can if I want to, but that's our reality and people are subconsciously make those preconceived notions about you before they even know you. Have you seen the movie uh, Hidden Figures? I did. Yeah. I just watched it last it week. Great, great movie. Yeah. Great movie. Yeah. Arenas and UFC fights, 
I mean, for sure, I'm doing it myself. You know, certain certain athletes um, in our sport, um, they show that the UFC or they show the the fans that they're marketable. And what happens is the UFC gets behind them. They help push them. You know, I'm a husband. I'm a father of four. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a gym owner. I'm an actor. I'm an analyst. I'm a stuntman. I'm a Christian. Every every avenue you can take it. I have those layers. I grew up in Ferguson. I grew up in gangbanging. I was in a family of 14 in a four-bedroom house, complete dysfunction, and I made a choice to be successful. What is there not to market? I fight like hell. I'm built a certain way. I've never taken a performance enhancement drug in my life. I just started taking supplements after two years, so sorry for this, man. You know, so with that said, why, why would they not want to market me? So I can complain about it and be the victim that we talked about, or the gentleman that's standing right behind you with the camera is my own propaganda, it's my own champ cap, my own series. So people don't get a filtered version of me. They see me for who I am, what I do, what I stand for, and what my game plan is, and how I want to be remembered. So I think you got to take control of your own career. That's why I do my champ life series. That's why I do my champ camp series. And I call it champ camp on purpose. It's accountability. If I lose to him, what is it going to be called? Contender camp? No, I purposely said that because I don't plan on losing this belt for a very long time. When I retire, I will retire as a champion. Are you confident the message is going to reflect today at home? It's already resonating. I don't put it out to. I don't put it out to basically get a certain amount of likes or views. Granted, that's great, and it helps me if I want to pitch it to somebody or if a bigger, you know, production company sees value in it. Yeah, views are great, but I know if one person calls me and say, man, you know what, Tyron, you're the best champion in the world. You're the Martin Luther King of MMA. Like, one kid said that on a post, and I don't even read the post because, you know, I get roasted a lot on social media. But so my, uh, my videographer, Lamar, told me that. And I'm like, man, when I feel like, you know, stopping and I don't feel like running, I don't feel like training, and I'm like, everybody always hating on me. What the heck else do I have to do to prove myself? It gave me that little extra uh, motivation to keep pushing. You talk about your legacy. Uh, the other day, or about a week and a half ago, I wake up, you're ringing the bell right now. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm low-key always doing something, you know, and it never really gets picked up, you know. No fighter has been in more movies than I've been in. I've been in Sons of Anarchy, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I've been in Olympus Has Fallen, straight out of Compton. I just did the, um, the Last Ship. I did a movie called Office Uprising. I stunt double Barry Sanders in a Pepsi commercial. I've done every commercial thing you can think of with no Asian, no representation, just old-school hustle, and it don't get picked up. Now, I was at... NASDAQ ringing a bell with one of my big sponsors, Mind Body Membership Software. I've been with those guys forever. So I'm doing the things that I'm supposed to do, and that's all you really can do. And I realized last year that I can't make someone like me, and people that don't like me, they probably don't know me. And those aren't the people that I wake up to every day that are you know, looking forward to me to bring home the check or to do something positive. That's my family, that's my kids and my friends. I can honestly look in the mirror and know that I've been the same fighter since Strike Force. I haven't taken on this character and went rogue and you know flipped out to sell a pay-per-view. All I'm doing now is I believe I'm the best welterweight in the world. I really believe that. Not just because I have the belt, because we can see a lot of people fight that fight, may, may not be deserving, may not be the number one contender, and it might not be that tough for the division. This is the best division in the world, and it's getting better. You know what I mean? So with that said, I just do feel like I'm the best in the world, and I'm okay with saying that now. You know, Stephen, we're talking about some of his community involvement stuff. Um, you obviously have, you know, uh, you're in school where you teach, you have a lot of students that look up to you. Can you talk about the reception when you got back home after uh, two or five? Yeah, man, actually, it, it was, um, you know, I actually didn't plan on going in that week and, and, and teaching just because of my, my, my nose and the stitches that I had. And, but uh, ended up having to go in anyway, and it was pretty cool. The first class I went into, you know, half my students had uh, painted black eyes <laughs> on their faces, man. That's and cool. and uh, so it was pretty cool to see the support when I got back home. And you know what? And that's one of the reasons, like you said, we do what we do, man, you know, to change people's lives. You both stand up fire. Thank you. You were talking about social media. Do you think uh, social media is helped you or harmed you? Um, it's helped me because uh, when I'm doing social media, 
I'm my own filter. I, I put out what I put out because that's what I feel. And um, sometimes I, I might need to give a couple more seconds of thought before I post it out. But in general, I usually, you know, filter myself. And I'm not putting it out because I want to please you. You know what I mean? You're never going to please me. Right? So many, there's so many people who have a PhD in teaching you how to be a champion. You should fight the, you should defend against all, all these people first. So no, you should never fight this fight and you don't deserve this. So, so many people will tell you, but if you really think about it, what type of person, you know, I, I was talking to a buddy of mine, Hanato Laranja yesterday. What type of person sits there all day and so focused on what the hell you got going on and not focus on what they're doing, their legacy, their journey, and what they want to do. So why would I really take any of those comments to heart? So I think it's helped me because it's given me an opportunity to express myself and to get who I am out and to get certain videos or pictures or share the moment. Some people really want to know, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? We know you train and eat grass and you know never have a bad meal. We know you do that. But what do you like to do in your spare time? We want to see you laugh a little bit, joke around, hang out with some other people. And you know that's what I used it for. Yeah. Have you noticed the youth maybe kind of changing and becoming MMA fans within the African American community? You know, I'm gonna put a strong, um, a strong, you know, push on the UFC. I think that's their job. You know, I'm. I think I'm the only African American fighter on the roster that can really capture that market, especially with Floyd Mayweather retired or talking about coming back. That market is up for the grabbing, but you got to educate the community on what it is. Most people in the African American community or the urban community or the boxing community, whatever the heck you want to call it, those individuals think that mixed martial art is crazy. A whole bunch of crazy white guys kicking the hell out of each other with a sprinkle of a few brothers in there. That's really their thought. They don't see it as karate, wrestling, jujitsu, taekwondo, um, sambo. They don't see it as a beautiful art with so many different martial arts combined in there. And not only that, it's an affordable art that they might not be able to afford golf or tennis or something like that. They can afford mixed martial arts, you know what I mean? So with that said, I think it's a UFC job. I've done so much. I went on a 40, 50 school tour, talking to kids, giving out free seminars, giving the shelters, doing everything I can because that's what I'm supposed to do. I don't need a lot of video and credit for it. But if they want to take it to the next level and really capture that market, I feel like New York would have been a perfect opportunity. The mecca of hip hop. We could have done a little bit better to promote me in a different way to grab that market, not only just for pay-per-view buys and to bring in a completely different demographic, but to also for the youth. This is a way to keep them off the street. This is a way to turn some of that rage and you know aggression into something positive. And also, martial arts is respect. Uh, respect. The whole thing about martial art is discipline. There was a point in time where I was about to stop fighting. Because it lost that. It lost the Bushido spirit. It lost the martial art. It lost the respect, the honor, integrity. When I was the number one contender, and I was like, when's my shot? I done fought four number one contendership fights, and everybody's jumping me because they got a better looking suit and they talk more crap. So now, I got to take a different lens on it. You know, mention respect. You, you, you must have some respect. <coughs> I, I don't want to your mouth, but for Stephen, you know, he comes from a very traditional style. Yeah, yeah, I have respect for Steven because he's a, you know, he's a true martial artist and a uh, true student of the game. I have, I've always respected him, but, but the thing people don't know about me is I'm not just this fighter that just goes out and swings the right hand. I knew Steven was going to get to this point. He'll tell you, I had conversations with him and his dad when he was about to fight Ellenberg. I saw Steven, I saw Brandon Thatch, I saw Gunnar Nelson, I saw Neil Magny. I wasn't even a champion yet. As I'm chasing down the top dude, I already feel these guys breathing down my neck. He's just the one that took it to the next level. You know what I mean? Those other guys had their opportunities. They was right in the mix. He took it to the next level. So he never got here and took me by surprise. I've already, those are the guys I watch because those guys had the biggest up curve and they can change the most. Matt Brown was going to be the same Matt Brown. Robbie Lawler was going to be the same Robbie Lawler. Carlos Conner was going to be the same Carlos Conner. Damian Maia is going to be the same Damian Maia. None of those guys are going to change. They're the, they're the fighters they are. So why would I waste all the time studying these guys when you got these up-and-coming fighters that can bring so much more to the table? Dan, we're going to be break for a couple of quick pictures. Food's starting to come out right now. <laughs> are y'all going to do us like that with their fried chicken? <laughs> we stand here. They got some fried chicken here because it's his brother with the belt. <laughs> and I'm putting it out there.
It's a conspiracy. <laughs> and he's he, he gonna eat some too. Uh -huh. So we, so I'm we about both tear it up. <clears throat> no, no, um, no unfair oh. advantages. We both finna get down. Right. 